provides welcome and helpful feedback. This episode is entitled Labyrinths in Prisons, a Case Study, and my guest today is Beth Mace, one of the founding members of the New England Labyrinth Guild. Beth helped establish a prison labyrinth program at a medium security correctional facility for women in Massachusetts. Beth will share a poster presentation about her group's work during the research sharing circle on Thursday afternoon at the Houston Labyrinth Society gathering. So welcome to Many Paths, Many Visions, Beth. Thank you for joining me today. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm really honored to be on um, on the program, and I hope that I can share some of the experiences and knowledges, knowledge I've gained over the years during Labyrinth work. Great. Well, let's begin, first of all, by naming the other members of your group who created this prison ministry or prison labyrinth program and completed the study that you did uh, with you. Sure. So um, in addition to myself, um, I have four colleagues and friends that have helped, and uh, that would include Jane Fadden, uh, Jeannie Colbath, Kay Dorlando, and Joan Murray. And I understand that Kay is coming with you also to the gathering this year. Yes, she is, and uh, that would be great to um, to share. We went to last year's gathering together as well, and it was always um, a tremendous experience. Okay, terrific. Okay, so now, um, so there's like, so that was four, four of you. Or so? Yes, four, including myself. Including myself would be five. Okay, five. So now, so so now give us the context the sort of the background of how and why your this group of you women decided to pursue this service venture it's a very it's a very unique path well um quite honestly Christiana, i think um we were just you know simply called to do this type of work i don't know that there was any single experience that any of us had had but we just really wanted to do work in in prisons with women and um, personally, I've done a lot of different labyrinth projects and initiatives and programs from hospitals to schools to um, a lot of different types of ministries. And the prison work is very compelling because you're working with a group of individuals who are largely forgotten um, by the rest of society. And they're so appreciative of any attention and any anything that you can do with them. So it's very satisfying work um, because they're so just delighted to, that you've come in and that you've, you know, changed their, their sort of monotonous routine pace. So um, in the four, five of us, we were all friends um, from being involved with the nonprofit group that I helped co-found called the Labyrinth Guild of New England. And over the years, we've, we've developed a friendship and all of us, as I said, were sort of just called to do this type of work. I, you know, we put out sort of a feeler for it, and these were the one women that came sort of bubbled to the surface. And and so you do have a so what the the background of your the five women are you all in social services? Do you have social service degrees, psychology? I mean, was there a how you came together for this particular out of all of the people that you? No, and so it's, it's kind of funny actually. There, um, two people um, are, are ministers here, and um, that would be Jane and, and Joan. Uh, Jeannie Kobath is a holistic nurse. Um, Kay's um, a, a, a friend of mine from college. Actually, we've been buddies for quite a long time, and um, I'm a you know I have a professional job as an economist. So there's sort of a wide range of uh, different groups of people here, but we all had the common desire to work together to, to do this initiative. Hmm. And all with a strong service-oriented bent to all of you in terms of, of labyrinths and, you know, taking it outside of yourselves to a, a bigger community. Yeah, exactly yeah. right. Hmm. So, 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 why did you pick this the correctional facility that that you pick? Why is that, why that this particular one, and and how did you gain access to it? Um, well, we were at this this um, particular prison. It was a women's prison. We were drawn to doing work with women, um, and it was in fairly close proximity to all of where we lived. And honestly, there aren't. There's only, to my knowledge, only really one. 
um, facility in Massachusetts for women, and it includes women that are um, not yet convicted. So those would be women, it serves as a jail. So jail is where you go before you get convicted. Prison is where you go after you get convicted. Mm -hmm. So this particular um, property includes both people that are waiting to be brought into court as well as those women that have been convicted. It would include a group of women um, you know, that are there for short-term sentences, and there were women there that are there for a long-term life incarceration. And it's kind of shocking when you go into a prison initially that you look around and you see what look like little babies, honestly, these young girls that are um, in you know prison for largely for some type of drug-related situation that they may have had in their in their life. And um, we initially approached the, this prison by trying to work with the, the ministers of the, of the prison. And we actually didn't get very far with that. And uh, one of us met the uh, supervisor for the prison at, a, at an event, and the conversation got started. And that's how we initially sort of got them to listen to us that we wanted to do work within um, this woman's prison. We wrote a proposal said what we thought we were going to do, um, described that we would be bringing in a canvas labyrinth into the property. And uh, as we, you know, after our initial experience there, we sort of developed the program um, as we moved through the program and we did it more frequently. But initially we were thought we would just bring a labyrinth in and I think introduce it to inmates and see what happened. And then as time went on, it evolved. And, and in order to, um, you said you submitted a proposal. Did you include um, any research from other any other um, prison labyrinth programs that you knew of? Yeah, absolutely. We uh, described in the proposal. We described who we were. Uh, we described at that time. This is um, in two thousand and eight. We described the number of, of jails and prisons across the U.S. that had uh, programs already. One was a program at the Louisiana um, Maximum Security Prison for, for Women, um, LCIW, uh, St. Gabriel's Prison. There was also an Indiana uh, women's prison, um, and I think a, a Kentucky prison at the time as well. Since that time, I think that there are a number of programs that have um, developed. There's one in western Massachusetts for men, that has been developed, and I'm pretty sure, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure the Labyrinth Society has a sort of a, a group of people that have done prison work that uh, talk amongst each other. Um, I got inspired from Ellen Muk, who had been doing a program in Chicago, and she had um, actually gotten a little bit of publicity for it and had some articles written in the Chicago Tribune for it, and that was the inspiration for me. I think they you can get empowered to do something that you think that you can't do when you know that other people are doing it. So hopefully our conversation today will sort of use, be a, a kickoff for someone who's been having this idea in their head and they don't really know how to go about it. And I'd be, of course, really happy to talk to someone about um, moving forward on the program as well. Great. Um, so now, now, okay. So now you wrote the proposal, they said, okay. And that's um, as someone who has personally been involved in a, in a prison uh, labyrinth ministry in, on, in Oregon, um, bringing something in like that is, a, a, is tough. There's so many rules and regulations. Um, can you uh, speak to this in terms of the process your group had to go through in order to be volunteers at this facility? Yeah, to be honest, to be honest with you, it was a bit intimidating at first um, because most people haven't had any experience with the uh, sort of the you know in prisons and incarceration in the U.S. So initially, you have to have security checks done in yourself, and they have to make sure that you haven't um, done anything that's going to make them leery of going into the prison. You also can't have any relative within the, in my case, Massachusetts prison system. And um, you have to go through a, a training. Now, it turns out that this particular prison has uh, a tremendous number of volunteers. And so they have a pretty regular program to train volunteers. And that consists of uh, things from as basic of what you can wear, what you can't wear. 
So in this case, you can't wear jeans and you can't wear white sneakers. And that would be because you because that's what a lot of inmates wear. So they want you to be distinguished, able to be distinguished from the other inmates. You can't have any jewelry on. Um, you can't bring anything into the prison um, that could be considered or could be turned into any type of a weapon. So in our case, we typically bring in our big canvas labyrinth. Uh, we bring in uh, golf pencils, the little short little pencils. You can't bring in a full pencil because the metal part of the pencil could be used for some type of a weapon or a pipe or something like that. So it's very specific exactly what you can bring in and out of the prison and you get checked. So um, when we go in, maybe we'll have, you know, 15 pencils and we have to make sure that we come out with 15 pencils. So you learn about that. Um, you learn about the, the security that you have to go through. It's sort of like now it's not that different from going to an airport and being, you know, buzzed to make sure that there's nothing on you that can't get through the security at the airport. So um, I think we're all more conditioned to having that type of um, research done on ourselves. But initially at the prison, it was, pretty, it was kind of intimidating. And then um, following that initial sort of introduction, at this organization, you have to also get sort of updated every 12 months or so and uh, to get recertified to go into the prison. And initially, we were sort of perceived as guests. So we had to be with um, security guards or we had to be with an employee of the prison before we could walk into the grounds itself. In time, we were able to get our own approval that we didn't have to be with someone to walk on the grounds. Um, so that we could go in um, a little bit more casually when we were going there to do the programs. Yeah, in the, my experience, um, there was a level that had a certain number of hours. And at first you were guests and you had to go in with, in our case, the, the prison the minister, the head of the program, um, and or you know someone else who was, you know, had a badge, that kind of badge. And then you had so many hours that you had to complete as a volunteer. And then you were bumped up to the next level where you could walk in on your own. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. then but we also did the same thing. You had to have, you had to have um, updated. You had to do the, uh, any tests that you got on, online. You had to complete. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're, they're quite, they're quite, they're quite I mean, we, we learned things as well. So we ended up using a gym as the space that we had when we brought the labyrinth in, we had, um, as part of the Labyrinth Guild in New England, we own several different size labyrinths. So we would bring in a 24 foot and the, the, the gym actually would fit a 40 foot um, labyrinth as well, which is quite large. And we would, um, you know, we paid a lot of attention initially to how we positioned the labyrinth in this gym space because we wanted to be sure, or we were instructed to be sure to make sure that there was um, uh, that we could get we could exit if we needed to, or we wanted to be close to the door, um, or that we had a guard that was in the in the gym with us as well. And that's not to make anyone nervous about working in prison. We never we've never had any issues, but I think that there's you know certain precautions that you want to make sure that you're you know that you're that you feel comfortable and safe in the space that we're in. So we would we paid careful attention to the location of the labyrinth within the gym, making sure that so sort of, that we as the volunteers had more access to the door than um, than the inmates had, just in case there was anything that that would happen. We also were required to wear like little um, I guess sort of whistles or sort of a warning clip that we had that you know if you pushed a button it would indicate that there was some type of trouble that was brewing. And as I said, we've never had any problem with it. But I think, you know, it's in the best interest of um, both the volunteers and the staff at the prison, as well as for the inmates, to just make sure that we're, you know, feel comfortable and secure in the space that we're in. Um, I got so many questions here, and I'm, and I'm going to go off script, but I don't want to go too off script. So I'm going to stay on script for right now. <laughs> That's um, fine. Um, so... Let's talk about the facility again. It, I, I'm not going to comment on the on its uniqueness. It is a unique facility, but according to Wikipedia, uh, this facility operates at a, now at 145 percent capacity, with 63 percent of the women incarcerated for nonviolent offenses, mostly drug related. Also, three quarters of the women are mothers. 
can you comment on these statistics and how it relates to your labyrinth ministry there? Yeah, I think the um, the biggest takeaway, the biggest sort of surprise for me was sort of exactly those statistics that you talked about that, you know, um, 63% of these women are there for nonviolent offenses. Most of them are drug related. So these are a lot of the population that I dealt with were younger women. So we work with a population of, of women that were going to be released within the next 18 months. So they may have been there on a, on a drug related offense that was an 18 month term or, you know, just a few year term. And your heart really, to me, opens up quite a lot because these are, a lot of these are women that are less than 25 years of age and sometimes even more babies than that. And, you know, they made a mistake and, you know, they probably made a bad mistake, but it was a mistake. And, you know, you realize that all of us make mistakes. And so for me, my heart really went out to, went out to them that they made a mistake, but they were the ones that were caught in making the mistake. And, a lot of these are women that have, you know, are mothers, and to be taken away from your children is really tough. And to, you know, the flip side is I, I am a mother, so I felt sort of motherly towards a lot of these young women and could feel the pain of the mothers on the outside, wondering what was going on with their daughters on the inside. So in the course of doing our programs, you could see often that these women would come in sort of tough, tough as nails because you have to have that persona I think if you're an inmate in a, in a prison uh, today in America but you could watch them sort of um, shred that, that guard as they worked with the labyrinth with us and you saw that they were just you know these young, young girls that um, you know had a problem or made a, made a mistake and they weren't all young girls there were some people that had been there for you know 20 years and they were going to get released within 18 months as well and you know, the anxiety associated with that. So it's a population that's of people that are very easy to sort of empathize and sympathize and hope and pray for them because they've, they've got such challenges while they're in that prison. And then when they get out and, you know, as you said, 63% are in there for nonviolent crimes and what a price they've had to pay for that. So it's, it's very moving and touching to work with these um, young, girl, young women and, and older women as well. And now in terms of drug-related, now, so are, are many of these um, on meds, are they routinely prescribed this, like on a daily, like if they get into the meds line when they finish with the lab? I, I know, I don't know. The one, you know, I know very little about the sort of the demographics or the, the, what, and I don't know very much about the women when they're walking in the door, and that's probably a good thing. Um, there's very little identifying information that's exchanged from them to us or us to them. So I don't really know um, what kind of situation that is. I know, as I said, that this particular prison has a lot of programs for um, for the women, and a lot of those programs are drug-related and alcohol-related um, programs. So there's a lot of AA and a lot of NA programs that occur within here as well. And so the, let's uh, so describe in more in detail um, your, your labyrinth walk program. Did you, was it, did you map it out for the month and how many times a month did you go in? Well, we tried really, we really wanted to get in there quite frequently. It turned out we went, we, um, went about once every quarter probably. And we tried, we tried to, um, get in there at a more high frequent frequency but it didn't really play out so we were as i said part of a program we did we did two different programs we did one program for a lifetime inmates and a second program for women that were being released within the next 18 months mm -hmm. and the program itself what we did sort of evolved in time but what we essentially did we had two hours and during the course of the two hours we typically had um three labyrinth walks and um we would, uh, I guess I would almost call it a four-prong approach. We offered three walks in two hours. Um, we provided a little bit of education on the background of the labyrinths. And then we combined some of the complementary therapies of meditation and journaling. We had finger labyrinths that we used, and then we had discussion um, where insights gained during the walks were shared with each other. 
So initially, we would um, start the program by um, describing a little bit about what a labyrinth was, describing what it was, very briefly. Um, then we would introduce ourselves and introduce the inmates to each other. They all knew each other, but um, by first name only. We also, when we were giving information on the labyrinth, we would give a description about some labyrinth etiquette and how to walk a labyrinth. And we actually demonstrated that. So two of us would get on the labyrinth and we would walk, you know, like passing someone or when you pass each other going in the same direction or in the opposite directions. Because we really wanted to demonstrate polite etiquette um, on the labyrinth because we weren't quite sure what the relationships of these inmates would be towards each other. So we wanted to make sure that there wouldn't be any type of um, disharmonious uh, walking, I guess. And um, after we sort of demonstrated the labyrinth etiquette, we would do a short little movement exercise of a stretch or a yoga um, type of position just to get people loosened up a little bit. And I have these beautiful chimes that I got in Chart a number of years ago, and I know a lot of labyrinth people that have been at Chart have the same beautiful chimes. And I would um, do what I would call it, would chime the group. So I'd try to, you know, get, get people into a more meditative spot um, using the chimes, because we were in a bright, you know, brightly lit, fluorescent lit gym. So it wasn't exactly the, this type of space that you would think that you might want to have for a uh, meditative spot. But, you know, we also had music that we brought in. Um, my friend Christine Toulis plays beautiful um, Celtic harp. So we would have her music playing in the background. So we were able to create more of a, of a sacred space, I guess I would describe it. But that would chime the, the um, inmates and then those of us who were volunteering. And then we would do what I would call sort of a test run, the first walk. And I'd stay at the entrance of the lab. But this, this wasn't huge numbers of people. We're talking at most by me 20 women at any, a single event that we had. But I would pace women onto the labyrinth and then let them walk. And you, you can see people, they were suspicious, they were questioning, they didn't quite know what it was all about, and very skeptical that they could actually get into the entrance, from the entrance, excuse me, from the entrance into the center. Mm -hmm. and the way that I teach the labyrinth program is, is similar to the way that a lot of people who've been trained through the Labyrinth Society or through Veritas, Lauren Artress's group, um, you know, that the labyrinth walk is a, it's a sort of a three-phase walk. In the first phase, you sort of walk to the center and you're purging or getting rid of a lot of um, sort of busy noise in your head, the monkey brain, so to speak. Then in the center, we talk about that as a spot of illumination or insight. And then the path of the way back out would be the path of communion and bringing what you've learned back out into the, into the world, so to speak. Not that you have to do it as structured as that, but that's sort of the metaphor for it. So I would sort of describe that to the inmates. But they were skeptical, as I said, that they could actually make it into the center, um, at which point then they did it and then they came back out. And you can see that they were pretty happy about it, <laughs> that they actually were able to do it. Then we'd have a little bit of a discussion group. We'd reflect on the walk. What was the experience? What was your experience? How was it like to walk with other people? How was it like to walk by yourself? Sometimes there was a little bit of nervousness, you know, like a nervous laugh, but um, they got it. And then we would then have uh, a second walk. And in the second walk, uh, we would do that often where I would give a specific uh, sort of um, intention that I would say, um, you know, I want I would pass out a piece of paper and I'd ask them to write down that which was not serving them well, so sort of that act of shedding. And they would write down, some people would write down quite briefly a few things and other people would write for like a half an hour, not a half an hour, maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes, mm -hmm. of things that just weren't serving them well. We, then, we would then ask them to take that information, that piece of paper that they had, and walk it into the center of the labyrinth. And um, in other labyrinth programs, sometimes you can have a little burning bowl in there that you can shred or burn that which is not serving you well, the concept, the metaphor for that. But, of course, you can't do that in prison. So we would leave it in a little basket in the center and then 
we weren't allowed to take it out of the prison because that was something that we hadn't brought into the prison and you can't take anything out that you didn't bring in. But we would end up, we ended up shredding those in a paper shredder. So that was sort of symbolic of getting rid of that. Then the inmates would walk back out. So this would be the second walk that they had. And we would come together again as a group to talk about the experience. And if time permitted, uh, which it usually did, we'd actually have a third walk. And in this case, we created um, sort of business card size um, cards that we would write one or two words on that were specifically designed by the group of us for what we thought would be important um, symbology and words for inmates. Um, fairly simple words, simple concepts like forgiveness, love, kindness, um, uh, um so, sort of trying to frame some of the feelings and the emotions that they have within the prison. Mm. And the cards are really interesting because then they would then they would take those cards and walk into the center as well. And they loved those cards and they were thrilled because we got to actually let them keep those cards. And because inmates get so few things and so few personal things that I give to them, it was really a treasure gift, the card that they got and the word that they got on that card. And my experience is when you use cards, people, for whatever reason, usually the card is quite significant to that to the individual who gets it. It seems to resonate with them for the experience that they're having. And um, it was a real treasured gift that they got to, that they got to take out with them. So they got to take those with them. Um, when we were done, so that would be two or three walks that they had. Um, I learned uh, ultimately to then bring everybody onto the labyrinth itself and sit on the labyrinth. And the energy of sitting on the labyrinth somehow frees people up to be a little bit more forthcoming about their experiences. And this was the time of the event that you could really see how women could change from sort of a hardened shell when they first came in to being sort of soft and warm and, and open. And that was simply from walking the labyrinth one or two times. It was quite amazing to watch. And then they would talk a little bit, sometimes quite intimately, about the experience of being incarcerated, the experience of being in the prison, the loss that they were feeling, the inability to see their children or their family or their friends, um, anger at themselves for what they had done, uh, frustration with the system. So you'd see a lot of different emotions and feelings coming out of it. Um, and we do that um, again until the sort of time started to come up to the two hour period. Then we would get around in a circle one more time and we'd uh, talk about, we'd each say what I would call sort of the popcorn method of, of, of speaking. And we let everybody say a word or a phrase to describe the experience that they'd had in the last two hours with us in the, at the labyrinth. And in general, the words were just, they were really wonderful. They were things that you had hoped that you could um, share with each other. That, you know, peace, love, kindness, forgiveness, um, uh, quiet, uh, things like that. And it was, it was a really awesome experience, quite honestly, Christiana. Hmm. So, um, so you would say that the anxiety that, which is one of the key issues for any kind of inmate in any situation, in a prison situation, you could say, that, I mean, it was noticeably lessened by this experience. That two hours, that's a long time. I'm, I'm very surprised that they allowed you that much time. And usually it's so regimented in prison systems. You know, every hour is accounted for. So that's pretty amazing. So it sounds like it really had a, but having that amount of time had a really um, uh, positive impact. Well, that's funny. You know, I have to tell you, the very first time we did it, um, two hours seemed like 12 hours. Like, who am I? Who am I? And that's how we ended up doing three labyrinth walks, which seems like a lot of labyrinth walks to do in that, that time frame. But, but the first walk went pretty fast, and then... Um, you know, that's how we, we went from, like, I think initially we thought we'd do one walk, and then we went, oh, geez, we have another hour and a half. So we'll do two walks, and then we went into three walks. So then we started to figure out a, a you know, a sort of a theme for each walk. And the shedding theme was really powerful, um, that they were sort of given permission, 
you know, we all need, I don't know why we need permission, but to permission to sort of forgive ourselves. And um, we were able to, to at least provide that notion of forgiveness of self. And, you know, it was really powerful. We had uh, one, a few times we'd have inmates that would come back for more than one. They, they were repeated sort of participants. And they were just so anxious to come back and to experience the labyrinth again. Now, we would, you know, we tried to um, describe the experience as, you know, um, and I think probably you in the audience have heard this before, that they, sometimes the labyrinth experience can last a long time. And it might not be at that moment that you get an insight or something, but it might be at that moment that you get an insight, or it might be, a, you know, a week or two later. So the Labyrinth Guild of New England, we have these lovely cards, um, sort of paper the size of 8.5 by 11 sheets, that have a slightly um, raised labyrinth on it. And we were allowed to give that to the inmates as a gift, and that allowed them then to take that labyrinth image to, like a finger labyrinth, back to their, um, their cells to use that to allow the experience to last a longer time. We also passed out, as a gift at the end, a simple image of the shark labyrinth, and probably everybody is familiar with this image. It's a shark labyrinth that has the candles around the, the, um, the perimeter of it. And it, you know, and it glows inside the cathedral. And the inmates were just, you know, it's sort of three things that we left with them. One was this labyrinth card, finger labyrinth. One was this image of shark. And then one was that little card that had that word on it. And, you know, they were just beyond thrilled that they had these things to, to take with them. It was really, it was really quite neat. We also gave them... Um, Believe it or not, just a sort of a quiet space for two hours. And it's not very often that inmates get quiet space. And it was quiet space that we put, you know, very nice meditative music on. So that was able to sort of lift them into um, a different spot as well. And we gave them pencils and paper to write or to draw. Um, and that was something that they didn't often get as well. So that was pretty powerful. Um Often you teach the labyrinth as sort of a, a metaphor, a path for where you are. So we spend a lot of time with that. Um, I would get on the labyrinth myself in, you know, at some of those switchbacks is how I would call them, the turns on the labyrinth. You know, sometimes they come fast and furious. And then sometimes you're on a long, meandering path, especially on the outside of the, the, of the, you know, the traditional sharp labyrinth. And I would describe that to people about, you know, where I would ask them to see figure out where they were on their path, where they were on their life cycle, and where they, you know, think about the times in their life where the switchbacks of the turns just came at you fast and furious, and then think about the long paths. The long paths for the inmates might be, you know, while they're inside the and in being incarcerated. So trying to so with that as an idea. Um, and a concept, you can see that that experience then can last a long time for an inmate if you have them really visually start to think about where it is that they are on their path. Um, are they on the long, smooth part, or are they in the part that's changing rapidly? With the metaphor, of, you know, that we're all the same, and we're all trying to get to the center and figure out, you know, what, what life is all about. So the similarities and dissimilarities between us. So, as I said, it was a really... It's, it's a really powerful experience to work with this group of women. Excuse me. Sorry. Sorry about that. I didn't turn off my phone. Forgot all about it. Um, let's... There we go. <laughs> okay. Um, well, yeah, it sounds like, it sounds like this is... Uh, you really were very thorough. Now, let me, t first of all, how did you, how did the, how were the inmates picked? You mentioned that some people, some of them came back. How were they picked initially for this? I mean, there must be, how many inmates? I mean, it's a, it's a way over capacity. So there's lots of people who are probably getting out in, in 18 months. But how were these particular ones? You said there were about 20. How were they, they picked? Part, they were part of a bigger program that was called Bridging the Gap. And it was this really terrific program that this prison had put together to help women prepare for themselves to leave the prison, whether they were there for, you know, 18 months or 
12 months or, you know, many years. So it was part of an education program. They, they tried to um, teach skills. They tried to build a resume. Um, I saw the space that they had. It was a beautiful space that they had created with books and, and um, you know, uh, in it, they taught interview skills. Um, had I lived a little closer, actually, I was, I was really interested in working with that program because they were truly trying to prepare them to be able to go out on their own to be able to live and be able to function. So as part of the sort of education and the training program, um, I don't know how many women were in there, but there are probably a number. And the director of that program then, I don't know if she selected or if the inmates themselves sort of self-selected who wanted to go to the labyrinth. She described the labyrinth um, to the inmates. We had sent her some, like that Chicago Tribune article I had talked about, we had sent her that. So she had some information and background. So when, when the women came to the actual program themselves, they weren't walking in blind. They knew something about what was going on. Um, but as you know, you know, you can hear about a labyrinth and you can read about a labyrinth, but you don't really know about a labyrinth until you actually walk a labyrinth. So um, that's what would happen. And some of those women would be in that program for um, several, you know, several months or maybe even up to a year. So that gave them the opportunity to come back and walk that labyrinth again when we came back. Okay. And the, as far as the volunteers, were it just the four of you, or did you have other volunteers join you for this program? Or no, it was just the four of us, and we would we would um, sometimes four of us would go, sometimes two of us would go, sometimes three of us would go, depending on the schedule and what when who was available for doing what. But you always had at least two people. Yeah, because we had to. Um, just the setup would have been challenging to do by yourself because you have to schlep a lot of stuff. So, you know, we had to carry the labyrinth in itself, and that's typically, you know, it depends on which labyrinth we had. We have, the, we have the, as I said, the 40-foot one, and that's quite heavy and quite large. Or the 24-foot one is still, you know, 50 pounds, 40, 50 pounds of canvas. So it takes usually two of you, and then we would carry in, you know, the other materials from the um, – you know, the pencils to the, the little cards that I was talking about. We also would make up um, we have, uh, eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. We'd put a, a make a sort of a little, a tiny little journal that they got to write in. It would just be the eight and a half by 11 paper folded over, but we would put a labyrinth on it and we'd put the date of the event. And that was for them to take with them as, themselves as well. So the sort of a little diary that they could take with them. So we needed at least two of us just to manage the logistics of all that um, stuff that I just described. And it probably was safety concerns as well. You know, you have to have at least, I would imagine, for... Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so then, now you said now in 2014, you or your group raised uh, enough funds to build a permanent outside labyrinth for this facility. Yeah, that was, that was really exciting, to be honest with you. It was... We'd, we'd been doing this program with the Canvas Labyrinth for several years, and it wasn't probably at the frequency that we really wanted to do it, but we were still able to do it, and every time we did it, it was we could, it was very inspiring to want us to do more. And um, we spent a lot of effort writing a proposal to build a permanent labyrinth, um, the, descri the description of what the, the size of the labyrinth would be, um, what materials we would use to build it. And it was the same group of women I'm talking about. Plus we had um, somebody who had worked with the Labyrinth Guild in New England in the past, a uh, fellow by the name Peter Howe. He helped um, us actually do the geometry and the, and the determination of the size of the labyrinth within the space. And on a really, 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 really hot two days um, in the summer, we uh, went into the prison, and they had given us a nice piece of space for the building the labyrinth. And um, we we drew it out with like a chalk or a spray can of paint to make the space. And then what we did is we we dug trenches, and the trenches were then going to be filled with some type of a stone dust, and that would be the path that would delineate the the way you walked. And then you'd actually walk on the dirt. So it was it was pretty cool because it took well it took us a long time to do it, but we had inmates that helped us. So the inmates dug the trenches, so to speak, and then they carried the stone to fill in the trenches. And um, 
it was a it was a it was a significant it was a big job. Um, it took a long time to do that, and, and the, 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 the um, it came out quite beautifully. Yeah. And um, they said that was two uh, two I think two years ago now. And the unfortunate part is, and this is sort of the lesson of the labyrinth, um, that we had it built. It was done in late summer. And uh, we wanted to go in and do a dedication and move forward with uh, with beginning a labyrinth program to the point that we were going to, in fact, train um, lifetime inmates so that they could do programs on the labyrinth, when, so that they didn't they wouldn't be required to work with us directly, that they could do their own program. So this is then this is where the story gets a little um, sad and kind of disappointing. We tried uh, many, 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 many times to go in there to do a dedication ceremony. We had the whole dedication ceremony, you know, structured how we were going to do it. And we just couldn't get the attention of the right people in the prison to come in and do that. I don't know if they thought it was intimidating or exactly what, but that labyrinth that we built that has been used. Um, and I just found someone who I, who had who had seen it Um and said that, you know, to their knowledge, it hadn't been used um, in the time since we built it there. Part of the challenge was that it wasn't, in hindsight, not that we had a choice, but it wasn't in the best location. It was in the, um, think of like a, a courtyard or a, a courtyard within a, a college campus or a courtyard within, built, surrounded by buildings. And there was an area that the inmates were allowed to walk. And there was like uh, up on a little bit of a hill there was a, a guard um, house, so to speak, you know, like a shed type thing. And we built the labyrinth actually behind the guard house, which didn't really make sense to me, but that's the space that they gave us. And they said that, that would be fine because most of the time it was used would be used during programs. And for a program, they'd have a special guard out to watch what was going on to make sure that everybody, the inmates were guarded and safe. What should have happened in hindsight is we should have put it in the area that was a more what was more commonly being used that the guard house guards could have watched it from the guard house instead of being behind the guard house. So I think that the location actually stopped its use. So um, you know I still we still try um, to to talk to the folks at MCI to see if we can get it moving again and we're in the middle of doing that yet again. The, the superintendent and the supervisors of the prison, the two women that we initially worked with on the prison program, have since left. So we're back, sort of back to square one, quite honestly. And I have a, um, on my to-do list is to write, yet again, a new proposal <laughs> to come back in and, and to reinstall the, the program that I was just describing to you because it, it's dormant right now. And the, the physical lab itself is dormant right now. So it's very um, disappointing, but I do know in my experience with the labyrinth is that the labyrinth works how it's going to work, and it works in its own way, and it doesn't always work the way that we think it should be working. So I like to think that the mere fact that the labyrinth is sitting on the grounds of this prison is meaningful, and I like to think that when the inmates walk by it, although they can't walk on it, when they walk by it, it might be doing something that none of us know what it might be doing. It might be it might be soliciting conversation. It might be you know making people curious that they're going to go read about it in the in the libraries and things at the prison. Um, I don't know what it's doing, but I, but I can't believe with the amount of effort that we put into doing it and with the inmate involvement that it's not serving a purpose, but it might not be the purpose that we traditionally think it should be serving. Hmm. So tell me, so you said that you had some inmates um, involved in actually building this labyrinth. Um, were they, are they the lifetime inmates or, or how were they picked to do this? And what was their response? Did you get a res any feedback from them, um, you know, about their they were, they, they were really quite thrilled to be honest with you and happy to be building it I don't know um, I know there were some lifetime inmates that were there um, I don't know how they were selected there are probably about 15 women it was really hard work um, it was really really hot it was really in, in the combination of the two they 
they worked and they dug, you know, we dug like 12 inch trenches to, to um, put the stone in. And um, they were, I think there was pride of ownership when it was all said and done. And, you know, I'm sure those women in particular are disappointed because they see it as not being used. Um, but I'm still cautiously optimistic that, that it will come back in a way that we don't quite know yet. <laughs> So, um, so th this is one of the pitfalls in dealing with a, a, you know, a bureaucratic organization that, that, you know, the, the, the administrators come and go. Um, do you have any suggestions for other people or recommendations for others uh, wanting to do this kind of work? I mean, it's very specialized work and you, it's not... I think, I know for me, and I remember, and you had the, your four women with us, it was different. We had a group that we really had to vet very carefully because we didn't know their backgrounds uh, outside of the fact that they liked walking labyrinths. Um, you know, but it, it, is, it affects the uh, volunteers as strongly as it affects the prisoners themselves, the inmates themselves. Um, and I know that it um, it is a very it can be a very moving experience, but it is a very specialized calling. You know, it's not like you know doing it for a, a, a you know a, a elementary school or something like that. This is a, a very specialized calling. So, what kind of suggestions or recommendations do you have for others wanting to do this kind of work? Well, I guess my first thought would be that you really have to have faith and belief in the labyrinth, and that the labyrinth does what it's supposed to do in ways that we don't necessarily know. So I'd say it's that notion of your expectations and to make sure that you, you know, you put yourself out there and you do your best, and you have an expectation, but not to have maybe a necessarily a traditional expectation because. You know, my experience with labyrinths, I've built them in schools, I've built them in prisons, I've built them in hospital grounds, um, that you really need an, an inside advocate for it because um, in a lot of those situations that I just described, I was an advocate. I got someone inside to, to be an advocate with me. But as I just described in this case, the two women that were advocates for it, who were the leadership of this prison have since moved to other positions so nobody knows what it's what it's all about, um, and so it's it's important to to sort of keep that dialogue going with you know many people I suppose in the organizations. I I built one at a school and um, I had a really hard time because the principal changed. The principal was in favor, and the principal changed, and then the new principal had no really interest in it, despite my talk to them about what it was all about. So. Um, I guess the, the other thing is that you can't have any ego involved with it. So you can't say, you know, I built this and I want it to be used because it's, it's not about us or me or you or the individuals who are doing it. We're sort of the, the um, facilitators or the um, ambassadors for it. But we, there's no, like, pride of ownership, I don't really think, with the labyrinth. We're, you know, we're sort of the, the tools of the we're work, we're the worker bees of the labyrinth, I suppose, when we're thinking about it. But I think it's important not to have too much of your own ego put into it and to have faith that, you know, if the labyrinth is meant to be there, it's meant to be there. And, and, and the thing with the labyrinth is you don't know, none of us know what the, what the impact of it is having on others. I mean, I've had the privilege and, and opportunity to witness people on the labyrinth for many years now. And, you know, we don't know what's going on inside someone's head when they're, when they're on the labyrinth. And the ability to witness people on the labyrinth is quite powerful. So maybe the ability just to witness a labyrinth without people walking on it, like that one that's now at the prison that's not being used, maybe that's the power of it. I mean, we simply don't know. So I guess, you know, to answer your question, you know, the experience can be frustrating, uh, especially when you put, I mean, we spent a long time fundraising to buy the materials for the labyrinth that we built as well. So there was, you know, a lot of work from a lot of people that went into it. So there's some frustration about it that it hasn't gone further. But, you know, it hasn't. So, you know, maybe, you know, it's almost like the labyrinth at Chart, right? It, it stood unused for 
you know, hundreds of years, and then it had, to, you know, it came back as in its own way, in its own life. So not set, not 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 implying that the one at the prison is going to do the same thing, but you know, there might be some, you know, even if it's affecting or influencing in a positive way one or two people, then it's well worth the energy and time that we put it in that we put into it. In my humble opinion. And you also then did a um, a poster presentation, created a poster presentation that uh, summarizes this this work and and uh, this program. Um, describe this a, a little bit. Yeah, that wasn't me. That was my friend uh, Jeannie Colbap, mm-hmm. and um, she did a program. Um, it was uh, for the first international integrative nursing symposium in Reykjavik in May of 2015. And that was a group that, um, was a group largely of nurses, well, mostly nurses, that gave poster presentations on different um, therapies that are being used. And Jeannie made this beautiful poster. I think you might have a picture of it, um, Christiana, that I had sent to you. But she made this beautiful poster, and she brought it over, and she introduced the concept of using the labyrinth as a holistic tool for stress reduction and self-reflection for this particularly uh, vulnerable population. And, um, you know, in her view, because she's got a nursing background, um, you know, she was trying to look at this, at the measure the stress um, that women have from the separation from their children. Um, and many other women have complex medical and, and mental diagnoses and history of trauma. So that sort of fit into the the symposium that was going on in Reykjavik. And so she was using the labyrinth as a way, as a tool, as a method to teach people that, you know, to try to um, reduce stress and introduce meditation to this vulnerable population. And, you know, she again, she's got a nursing background. I don't, and you would ask this initially about the background of the folks that we were working with. And, you know, from her background, she could see, you know, visual observation that there are fewer, fewer uh, facial stress markers. Um, you could see sort of a relaxation going on in their face. You could tell from the way that the women talked to each other and the way that their responses were. So she thought that, you know, truly it was making, the labyrinth was making a um, positive contribution to reducing the woman prisoner's stress. And, you know, potentially increase in the understanding and forgiveness of, you know, both yourself and those who contributed to your own in, imprisonment. So she brought it, as I said, over to Reykjavik and it went, you know, it was great. It was well received. And um, it was this really beautiful poster that she created, um, sort of um, further bringing the message out to the world about the labyrinth and different uses of the labyrinth. And in this case, the use of the labyrinth in a prison. Uh, specifically from a holistic nursing point of view. Hmm. Um, and was it well-received? Well yeah, it was great. Yeah, it was well-received. Mm-hmm. So, plus, she got to go to Reykjavik. So that was yeah. <laughs> See the northern lights. Um, so um, did, did any of the inmates, um, since they were, they were in a program, you said about, um, and I'm, I was, I've been looking while you've been talking um, to see if there are any questions. There aren't, so we're just going to keep talking. Um, is there, was there any um, indication? Did any of the women say, "Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm getting out of here in, you know, two weeks or whatever. I'm going to go look for a labyrinth to walk." Right. So we um, told them. About the you know the the different places that you can go through Veritas and Labyrinth Society and actually the Labyrinth Guild in New England has a little bit of a poster of, of a listing of where labyrinths are, and we would describe the um, some of the labyrinths and I encouraged them as I do when I do facilitate walks to you know every time you walk a labyrinth it's different you know it's who you are that day it's where your head is at that day how you're feeling that day that you bring onto that labyrinth. So every experience is different. And then the different places that you can walk a labyrinth, you know, this was an indoor labyrinth. So I would encourage them when they got out and tell them where there were some labyrinths in the Boston area um, that they could go and they could, they could walk. So I encourage that. And, you know, of course I don't know if they did or not. And we weren't allowed to give them any of our personal contact information. So, you know, I don't know what the, you know, what, what they ended up doing with it afterwards. But 
you know, at least some of the women that were being released relatively quickly after our events did in fact say that they were going to try to um, find further labyrinths to walk. And did they did they indicate, you know, after talking, I know you, you said generally that it was a very powerful thing, but can, I mean, and this is hard because they, you said there very few of them actually came back where it was with our program, there was a, a lot of, because it was only an hour, um, an hour each time we were in. So there was a number of people who came back regularly. I mean, they were regular labyrinth walkers and this was a, this was one of their, uh, things that they could do, extracurricular activities that they could do and sign up for. So it's a very a different type of program. It's interesting that there are so many different types in correctional facilities, but it really has to points to what the rules and regulations. While they're very similar, there are some major differences. Um, but did you get any feedback that that um, from the inmates that they had actually that the labyrinth had allowed them to? Um, Mom, allowed their relationships with their children, for instance, or with others on the outside, and made a difference in that, and, and allowed them to be uh, in, relate in a different way. Um, you know, it's hard to say, other than the the emotions that you could see on their faces when they were talking. So they would talk after each walk; they would talk. And, you know, there were some times that women would talk about, you know, breakdown in tears, that they missed their children or the disappointment that they had with themselves, that they had gotten themselves into this situation or this, you know, that they weren't able to, um, you know, uh, be stronger and got pulled in, you know, um, tempted into situations that got them ultimately in trouble. So I think a labyrinth often allows people to have what I call an aha moment. And that's when they learn something that they probably have been told and taught for many times in their life, but they don't get it until they quite get it. And this didn't happen to me, but this did happen to someone in a, um, who was doing a labyrinth prison program where there was a young fellow that walked in the labyrinth and instead of getting to the center of the labyrinth, it, it, it sent him back out to the front and he never made it to the center and he made a big scene about, you know, oh, this thing you know, spat me out and didn't let me get back into the center. But he, stood, he went back and he got into the center. He stayed and he followed what the instructions were and he came back out. Meanwhile, while he was doing this, there was a bunch of, you know, his fellow inmates that were watching, making fun of him for walking around in a circle and looking like weird by walking around in a circle. And he got off the labyrinth and he said to the facilitator, you know, I finally figured out that if I couldn't walk into the center of this without being affected by my peer group yelling and making fun of me, how was I ever going to make it when I left the prison? So it was that aha moment. And probably in his life, he'd been told um, umpteen thousand times to not let your peers dictate what you do. But he didn't get it until he got it at that moment. And that's the experience that I think we see a lot of people on the lab with being in prisons or in church settings or in schools or in hospitals. That really happens. It's, it's, it, it, the lab facilitates those aha moments. And so to answer your question, you know, I don't know if there were a lot of those moments that happened with these women or if it resonated with them and something came later on or not. But um, I have great belief and faith in the labyrinth. I do know that it speaks to certain people at certain times and really does um, shift them into a different um, a different way of thinking. So I'm assuming that for some of those women that in the program that we did that that that, that happened as well. Well, I, I can tell you that from my experience that it certainly did, and it and the women would come back and and re- tell us the stories of how much it changed their relationship with a, you know, a, a teenage daughter who didn't want to speak to them at all or, or a son who was acting out and, and, and it, it made a huge difference. Um, their experience on the labyrinth, they were act, they were able, you know, to do that exit, uh, um, idea of bringing it back into their lives and into their communities. And, and, uh, maybe not the first time or the second time, but over time, um, it, it made a, a big difference. So, 
Uh, I agree with you that um, it's been my experience that it certainly ha does is a very positive uh, tool for for um, this uh, population of, of people. So um, I think we're out of time, Beth. This has been great, and I really appreciate you uh, coming on as my guest today. And it's been a, a pleasure sharing this hour with you. Um, thank you so much. And, You're very um, welcome. It's been a pleasure, and I hope um, some of the people listening to this um, show today maybe we'll see you next week in Houston. Yes, yes, that would be great, and and many continued blessings on your path, and yes, see you in a couple of days in Houston. Okay, sounds good. Thanks very much, Christiana, and bye, everyone. All right, bye-bye. You've been listening to the Labyrinth Society's Many Paths, Many Visions, broadcast by Spreaker with your host, Christiana Brenton. Be sure to check the TLS website, Facebook page, Global Group, YouTube, and Google+. Plus. For a list of upcoming dates and guests, for more information, please go to www.labyrinthsociety.org. We will have one more possible podcast in um, sometime in December. Uh, the date is still up in the air, um, but we sh I should know uh, closer to the end of November uh, when that's going to be. So please uh, check back, and we'll have that set up. And then next year. We're probably going to start a whole new schedule with a new theme or many themes and with um, different hosts, which will be lots of fun, I, I think. So please stay tuned and please um, uh, listen in and uh, give us your comments and tell us what you think. So have a, a wonderful day, a wonderful weekend. Ciao, namaste, and may you find what you need on your path through life.